All right, this is our last lecture for the semester. So we were almost there. We're in the home stretch lecture, lecture 16B on paired tests. I know this isn't what I said on the original schedule, but I think this is an important topic that we can uh, talk about two things here, both the parametric and the non-parametric versions of a paired test. So this lecture check, I'll make this one do Saturday again, because I was late getting this one. Thanks for your patience. Uh, Saturday, April 26th, I believe is what I mean there. No, it is Saturday the 25th, okay. All right, so what is paired data and what is two sample data? Because they're similar to each other and you gotta know the difference to know when to use each of these tests. So paired data usually represents observations before and after or pre-treatment and post-treatment. And that's different from what we've seen before. We've used two sample tests before. Uh, two, when you have a two sample test, we have two distinct samples from two distinct populations. So for example, I think we did a, Couple examples like this back in person when we were meeting in class. Eight heights of buckeye trees are measured in Franklin County and eight heights are measured in Delaware County. We wish to determine whether there's a difference in the heights between the two counties. So we have two distinct populations here, right? Buckeye trees in Franklin County and buckeye trees in Delaware County. And we take two samples from each of those populations. This is a two sample test. There, notice there are 16 total observations here. And how would we conduct a hypothesis test in this case? Well, if we have a large enough sample size, we could use the central limit theorem. If we have not a large enough sample size, we could do a normally distributed data. We could use a t-test here, where we maybe use the pooled variance or we use the Satterthwaite equation. Um, but what about this situation? Eight trees are measured in the fall. We give them a fertilizer, and then we remeasure those trees in the spring. We want to determine whether the fertilizer augments the tree growth. So notice the difference here. We're measuring the same trees twice. So there are not 16 observations here. There are eight observations. Just because we measure something before and after, that doesn't mean we have two different trees that we're measuring. So we have one population of trees. There are eight trees only here. We just measured each of them twice. There's a, so that's the important difference between measuring something twice and measuring two different populations. Today, we're gonna focus on the second scenario where we're measuring something twice before and after. So <clears throat> as I mentioned on the previous slide, how would we analyze the two sample test where we have two populations and two samples from those two populations? We would do a t-test. We could use the pooled variance or the satterth weight approach that we have talked about before. But in this case, what if we have the paired situation where we have a before and after or a pre-treatment, post-treatment? Where, which is the example we have with these buckeye trees after we give them fertilizer. So we only have eight observations before and after. And so what we use as our observations then is the differences. So we're gonna test a hypothesis that the mean difference is equal to zero versus an alternative hypothesis that the mean difference is greater than zero. I use that capital letter delta that you've probably seen in chemistry class before to mean difference. So the null hypothesis is not about the individual heights of trees, it's about whether the change in height or the difference in the height has gotten bigger over time as they have been given the fertilizer. <clears throat> Excuse me. So suppose this is what our data looks like. We have a measurement before and after. Remember, this is just one single tree I'm looking at here. We've measured the tree twice before and after, and we saw a difference in plus two feet that the tree grew. And for tree number two, it was 13 and a half feet before, it was 16 feet after. So it's that tree's single observation before and after difference is plus two and a half. And so we measure eight trees is what I have here, and each of them has a difference. So my observations then are the third column here. There are eight observations measuring the difference in trees before and after, and so that's what I'm gonna use to analyze my data. So, if you think about it though, do we already have a way to analyze this? Suppose I can assume that the differences, how much the tree grows from the fertilizer is normally distributed. Do we have a method where we can analyze normally distributed data with a small sample size? Yeah, we already do. So what I need to do now is just do a t-test. Instead of doing the t-test directly on the data though, I'm going to do the t-test on the differences. So that's why I call it x bar sub delta and s squared sub delta. I wanna compute the sample mean and the sample variance of the differences themselves. So if you do that, and I'll put all those uh, observations back up there. So if you plug in that third column and compute the average of that third column, you get 1.95 feet is the average growth. 
and if you compute the standard deviation, you get 2.11 and n equals 8, not 28. So I'm going to double check that that mean is correct because that number looks off to me. Give me just a second here. Two, two and a half, zero, two point six, point five, six point five, one point four, one point one. Okay, yeah, so the mean is one point nine five. That number seemed off to me. But yeah, so my sample mean is one point nine five, the sample mean of the differences. The sample standard deviation of the differences is two point one one, and I have eight observations. And again, we know how to do this. Compute the T statistic. So x bar sub delta minus the hypothesized mean, the hypothesized mean difference is zero. That's how we would mathematically represent no change before and after with our fertilizer. So zero is what we plug in from mu here, because that's the null. Again, don't forget what you already know how to do. You plug in the values from the null hypothesis when you conduct a hypothesis test. And then we plug in the 2.11 and the square root of eight. We get 2.614 as our observed t statistic and under the null hypothesis assumption, that's going to follow a T7 distribution. So as we've done before, there's two different ways we can test that. If we have that T7 distribution for our observed T, I can, um, that's exactly the math we did before. I'm just showing that again, although that's T7, not T8. Fix that distribution. We can compute a rejection region uh, using the QT function because my alpha level is 0.05 and I have seven degrees of freedom. The rejection region begins at 1.895. That's where that vertical dashed line occurs. And my observed T statistic, the red dot, is at 2.614. That falls in the rejection region, so we reject the null and conclude that we do see a positive difference in heights after as compared to before. Or you can compute a P value. PT of 2.614, 7, um, lower dot tail equals false this time because my alternative hypothesis is greater than, and you get a p-value of 0.017, which is less than our alpha of 0.05. Of course, they both agree because they should agree if we've chosen the same alpha level for these same tests. So really what you've seen here, you haven't done anything new statistically or mathematically. We're just applying this to a different context of data where we are working with the differences in two observations before and after, pre-treatment, post-treatment, usually, not always, but usually, uh, is how that works. So hopefully this isn't too crazy because this isn't really anything new here. On the other hand, how do we do the non-parametric version of this? So we talked about non-parametrics last time. Suppose I cannot assume that those differences are normal. And it turns out that the when we use the T distribution, it's pretty robust to non-normality, meaning it still tends to work pretty well even when the data aren't normal. So you need some really crazy looking data to have to resort to this test. The Wilcoxon signed rank test is what this one's called. And this is the non-parametric version of a paired test. So suppose in this problem, I, want to, I measure the concentration of parts per million of a heavy metal in the bloodstream before and after iron hexacyanoferrate, or blue, Prussia blue is the chemical there that is uh, meant to absorb heavy metals. That's what you administer to combat heavy metal poisoning. And so before treatment, we have these measurements from eight subjects. And after one week of treatment, we have new measurements. And I've, ideally, we want those numbers to go down, right? Again, this is not two samples here. I don't have two populations of eight people in each one. I have one single population of eight people with heavy metal poisoning. I administer a treatment to them. I measure them before I administer the treatment and after I administer the treatment. So this is not a two sample test. This is a paired test. There's a big difference here. There's eight observations. We cannot assume concentration is normally distributed for this example. So we want to test an null hypothesis that the average difference is zero versus the alternative that the average difference is less than zero because we want them to decrease in concentration, correct? So we want that to be our, our alternative hypothesis. Um, we are going to test this at significance level 5%. And there's a link down there with the source where, with a couple of examples that you can look through in addition to this one. So how does this test work? Like we did last time with the non-parametric, we're gonna work with the ranks of these observations. So step one is to compute the differences and keep track of the sign, whether it's positive or negative, because 
whether somebody's heavy metal concentration went up or down makes a big difference. So you got to keep track of the pluses and the minuses. So the first person dropped by 10, that's good. The second person dropped by 20, that's better. The third person actually went up by 10. We need to keep track of that. So I've got my signed differences in the column there. That's step one to compute those. So that's just arithmetic. Keep track of the plus and minus. Step two is to order those differences, but you want to order the absolute differences. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you just ordered them from negative to positive or from positive to negative, uh, you would miss out on some of the information here. So when you order the absolute differences, notice it goes plus five, minus 10, minus 10, plus 10. So those tens, plus or minus, could have gone in any order there. I'm just interested in the absolute difference. So the five has to come first, then all the tens, plus or minus, then the two minus 15s, and the minus 20, and the minus 60. If there was a plus 70, that would come next. If there was a minus 75, that would come next. So you just ignore the sign for this step and just sort them by the magnitude of the value. So we've ordered the absolute differences now in step two. Step three is to rank them. And just like we did previously on lecture 16a, when you have ties, you just give them the average rank. So rank number one goes to the absolute difference of plus five. Uh, is that right? Hang on a second. Okay, um, I confused myself a little bit on that last slide. We're going to restart step three, rank the absolute differences. What I just did when I paused and restarted the video here is, which obviously you didn't notice, but, um, but I just split this table up because when you order the absolute differences, they don't correspond to subjects one through eight anymore. So the ordered absolute difference, I take those absolute differences and I sort them like we just did, and now I want to rank them. So one, two, three, four. Notice ranks two through four all are the same. They're all a value of 10. And so, well, plus 10 or minus 10, but remember, I'm not paying attention to the sign yet. So they all have the rank of the average rank. The average of two, three, and four gives you five. So then that's what my ranks look like for the absolute differences. Step four is to sign the ranks. So now you take the ranks that we just put in the previous step, one, three, 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 five, six, seven, eight, and then you go back and you get the sign that came from their difference. So the signed ranks now are plus one because the rank of one came from a difference of plus five, minus three because uh, that rank came from minus 10. And so notice two of the rank threes have a minus with them because they came from negative differences, i.e. the person's metal concentration decreased. And then the next three has a plus three with it because they came from an observation where the person increased their metal concentration. And so go through all the ranks and do that. And the intuition here should be that notice most of the big numbers in this case are negative, meaning most of the people who changed a lot decreased. Most of the people who changed a little um, also decreased, but a few of the people who changed, uh, who increased, changed a little as well. So that's then the signed ranks that I've got then in the last column there. Step five, compute what we call the W plus and the W minus. So the sum of the positive and negative ranks. So W plus, uh, where are my positive ranks? One and three are the only ones who increase their heavy metal concentration, right? And so one plus three gives you four, that's W plus. W minus, you look for the ranks that are associated with negative numbers, which is negative three, negative three, negative five, negative six, negative seven, negative eight, and you just add those values together and you get positive 32. So we disregard the minus signs again for this one. So four is the sum of the positive ranks, 32 is the sum of the negative ranks. Just like we did last time, our W statistic, like it was with the Man whitney U test, the W now is the minimum of those two, so my observed W statistic is four. Again, what was the point of all these weird steps? We do all this craziness with the ranks. The point is this W observed now follows a sampling distribution that we know how it's behaved. So my W minimum of 4 and 32 is 4. So my observed W statistic is 4. And uh, I just had a duplicate slide in there, I guess. And so then you look up a Wilcoxon chart. And there's a link to that here. I've copied a little bit of it here. And you can find the critical value. If you are less than the critical Wilcoxon value, you reject your null hypothesis. So I have a one-tailed test, right? That's my alternative hypothesis. 
was that the mean difference was less than zero. So for alpha equals 0.05, a one-tailed test with n equals eight, my critical value is five. So if I observe a W statistic of less than five, I reject my null hypothesis, which was what we do in this case because we observed four. So that is the Wilcoxon signed rank test. And I don't know why I had all duplicate slides in here. I got to go through and delete those. Um, let's do a simulation study just to reiterate the process of how we did this and see how this behaves with a large sample. So I'm going to go back to my first step because I don't remember the steps exactly off the top of my head. All right, so how do we do this? Let's start with a sample size of 30 to see how this test behaves with a large sample size. Are we going to get a normal distribution like we did with the Man Whitney test previously? Because well, the point I try to make at the end of lecture 16a is that we can use a normal distribution to approximate the sampling distribution when we have a lot of data. Let's see if that happens here as well. Let's do NMC equals 5,000. And I'm going to go through and compute a W storage every time. Let's do our Monte Carlo loop. So we'll have some before, and we'll pretend we're measuring blood concentrations again. So I'm going to generate uniform data. And I'm just generating uniform because I want something that's not normal. It didn't have to be uniform here. I could be generating anything that's not normal. I just want to keep it simple and generate simple data. So I'll do R unif uh, 30 of them. Let's say we want to go from 0 to 70. And I'm going to round those. So what this is going to look like is your blood concentrations before you take the pill or you take the, the antidote to heavy metal poisoning. And then after is going to be round our unif n 30 to 100. So notice I'm generating the afters from a distribution that is going to be inherently higher. The before distribution has a minimum of 0 and a maximum of 70. The after distribution has a minimum of 30 and a maximum of 100. So we should be seeing the afters higher than the befores in this case, right? So this would be like the numbers going up. Actually, I'll go ahead and change that to make it more consistent with the example we just did. I'm going to switch that. Uh, I'll switch my uniform distributions here so that now we have higher numbers before and lower numbers after, which is more consistent with the example we just did. So change your 30, 100, and 0, 70 to before and after. All right, so the first step, and now I'm referencing back to my notes here. Step one, compute the differences. So I'll create a vector called delta, which is just after minus before. And so what do we see here? So these are all the differences. Notice I see a lot of negatives, meaning a lot of people dropped their blood concentration. Here's one who went up by 21. Here's one who went up by 17. And here's somebody who went up by six. That's okay, that's gonna happen from time to time. Remember, this is random data. But overall, most people decreased, right? So we should be picking up on that with our test. So my delta was step one here, compute the differences. Step two, order the absolute differences. So that means I'm going to have that ranks is going to be the rank of the absolute value of the deltas. So now I'm ordering the absolute differences. So I just did step two and step three simultaneously. Here's step two with the absolute differences. ABS is the absolute value function and rank like I used on lecture 16a as well, then ranks all those. So here's all the ranks. You can see there's a couple ties that occurred in there. 16.5, 18.5 occurred a couple times. So they're taking the average rank just like we did in the slides. So the same thing's happening here. Step four, sign the ranks. So now I need um, ranks. I'm going to replace that as ranks times the sign of um, delta. So the sign of delta is just a plus or a minus depending on whether the difference was positive or negative. So notice the sign of delta just tells you one or negative one. Was the change negative or positive? So when I do ranks times that, I get the signed ranks now. So you can see again, most of the signed ranks now are negative, just like they were in the slides that we did. And few of them are positive because a few people actually went up in their heavy metal concentration. But what I'm basically doing is just taking each rank and multiplying it by either positive one or negative one 
depending on whether it came from a positive or a negative change in metal concentration. Uh, what's the next step? Step five, compute W plus and W minus. So W plus is the sum of the positive ranks. So W plus is going to be Um, let's see, some of the ranks, but I only want the ranks that come from positive values, right? So I want the ranks such that delta is greater than zero. So remember these square brackets will subset it. So the ranks of delta greater than zero gives me just those ranks that came from the positive ones. So like if I look at my ranks again, um, I forgot to run line 10 to get the signed ranks. There we go. So there's the signed ranks. So then the ranks of delta greater than zero gives me the positive ones. And then W minus is the sum of the ranks, but I just want the ones that had a negative difference. So with the square bracket subset of the delta is negative zero. So just to see what that looks like, there's all my negative ranks. So then W plus and W minus in lines 11 and 12 will give you the sum of the positive ranks, 27.5, and the sum of the negative ranks, negative 437.5. It should be no surprise that the sum of the negative ranks is a lot higher because more of my values were negative differences. So step six is to compute W plus and W minus, which is what I just did, and compare, uh, I need to compute the W now, which is the minimum of W plus and W minus, and then I need to store it. All right, so let's, run the study then, and let's see what my W sampling distribution looks like. Histogram of W storage shows me something like that. Um, it doesn't really look like a normal distribution, does it? Um, well, maybe, maybe half of it could be. Let's try an example where there's no difference. So let me generate uniforms from zero to 100 in both cases. So this would be like the drug did nothing because my before and after are the same distributions. Um, and there, it kind of does look like what we wanted it to. So yeah, that kind of does look normal. So um, yeah, it looks like maybe we can get a normal distribution to be an approximation of our sampling distribution when n is high here. Um, so that's non-parametric tests. Well, I guess that's that 3202. Um, so if you made it this far, thank you. Um, I will, uh, there's a lot of things we didn't get to and a lot of important things moving forward in your statistical careers. I hope that you know how to do. I'm gonna to try to compile a list for everybody that, and I know this is a tall order for a lot of people, but um, there's some things uh, that I recommend you get, look at over the summer. Some supplementary topics that you are going to want to have seen. God knows what the next semester is gonna look like. You know, Everybody's gonna be going into classes having taken a class and your professors are gonna assume you've seen certain topics that maybe we didn't get to in as much depth as we would have liked. I just have a feeling fall is gonna be another tough semester for everybody. So I'll provide a supplementary list of topics and some extra things that I encourage you to look at over the summer, but that's it for our content for 3202 for this semester. So I'll call it a night with that. Thank you for your attention.